On Friday evening, I was at home alone, watching TV. It was one of those programs where the good guy was sneaking up on the bad guy, and you knew something bad was about to happen. At that very moment, something slammed into my house. My house shook, and I was like, oh, what's going on? Where's my wife? <laughs> and uh, I thought for sure that uh, Ben Purdy was right. There's drop bears in Australia. One just landed on my roof. Oh, I couldn't figure out. I, I had no idea what was going on. And all kinds of scenarios are going through my head like aliens. And so I ran to where my big torch is. I grabbed my torch and I went outside and I'm shining the torch on top of the house. I'm like, who's out there? What's going on? Thankfully, my neighbor across the fence came to my rescue and said, uh, Steve, did your house just really shake? I was like, yeah. Yeah, did yours? And he said, yes, mine did too. He said, I, I don't know what it was. It was like an instant relief came over me to realize I wasn't going crazy. <laughs> uh, I wasn't the only one. And sometimes we can really question reality. We can wonder what in the world is happening around me. And this morning, as Jesus tells us this story about a landowner and his tenants, he's going to give us a reality check. Would you just pray with me now as we ask for God's help with this this morning? Father, we thank you so much that you are real. Your word is living, it's active, and you've given us in, insight into what is really happening in our world. Would you help us now as we consider your word, the story that Jesus told, to really comprehend that you are the God who has made this world. Your kingdom will come. Your will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now this morning, as you heard uh, the Bible read to us, and as we heard from the children's talk, you can see there's something going on with the people of Israel and Jesus is stepping into their history, into their lives in a very personal way, and he gives them this terrible insight that all they've been living for, all they've been doing for hundreds of years is about to be taken away from them and given to someone else. It's a reality check that they weren't ready for, and we can hardly accept and understand ourselves. But I don't think you got out of bed this morning to come to church and have a history lesson about the nation of Israel. And while I'm going to tell you what this story means for the people of Israel, this story is telling us there's actually something a lot bigger going on. Let me take you back to where Jesus got this story from in the book of Isaiah. It's not the first time the story has been told to the nation of Israel. In fact, 700 years before Jesus... God came to the nation of Israel through the prophet Isaiah, and this is what he said in Isaiah 5 and verse 1. The song of the vineyard. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one has a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? And so the first reality I want us to consider this morning is the reality of God's love. Listen to this song that God is singing over his people. It's a song of love. It displays God's great, passionate love in a personal way. And, and that's part of the reality of God's love. God's love is always personal. You see, this world didn't come into existence just for creation to sort of spontaneously do its thing and have no connection to God or no reason for us to be here. And as God's creation, the people of Israel back in Isaiah's time and in Jesus' time as well, 
as God's people failed to care for not only his creation, but the purpose that they were given to live in this world, God comes to them with this question, what more could have been done for my vineyard than what I have done for it? Can you hear God's deep longing in his heart that all that he's made, all that he's in control of, that he's given to us, be looked after and cared for? Now, I have no doubt in my mind that uh, the story Jesus tells is directly applicable to Israel. But as I said, it's connected to history 700 years before the time of Jesus. But I think if we go the next step higher, we can see it goes all the way back to the beginning of creation where God creates the world. And Isaiah gives us some insight that when God created the world, he established it or founded it. And he made it in such a way that it would be inhabited. Now, a lot of you here that know me know I'm crazy about nature, especially birds. I love to go out and look at all the different kinds. Uh, So far on my world list, I have 1,236 different birds that I've seen in the different countries of the world. So, yeah, I'm really into it. I do care about God's creation. And I love the fact that as a Christian... I can have complete confidence that this world is not as fragile as sometimes people make it out to be. Now, I know there's a lot of fear out there around climate change and all of that, and and maybe some of that is realistic, and I am aware of the dodo bird, okay? I know it's extinct, and I know there is an element of fragility in this world, but God founded, established this world, and it's not going anywhere until his plan says it's time to go. And I believe as Christians, part of our reality for us and our children, the ones who are being told all the time, watch out, be careful, be afraid. Folks, we have a security and a safety in this world that comes from God himself. We have his word that he made it, and he has a plan for it. This is the reality I love to consider in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, where it says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. In the reality of God's love, it is so personal. He has made a plan that we can rest in and rely on. God's love is reliable. And so in life, we can go out and we can interact with God's creation with confidence that God made this world to be lived in and this planet to be lived on in a way that no other planet in all of the universe has been created. And we have God's word on that. And that can give us a confidence that God's love is personal and it's reliable. Now, believe me, I could camp on this point for the rest of the morning here and a few days to come. I'd love to talk to you more about that, but I just want to say this. For me, I have grown up with this confidence that God is in control. I am a responsible steward with his creation, but I am a confident steward as well. And I want that for my kids and my grandkids and yours too. But there are some pretty bad things happening in this world and the creation. It's not just the dodo bird. There's lots of other plants and things, a whole rainforest that are being culled and destroyed. And I'm not trying to say that that's why Jesus told this story this morning, but in the big picture of things, we have this reality, not only of God's love, but the reality of sin. And the reality of sin is this, all of God's creation is under a curse, and it's always been personal. Sin has always been personal. It has always been against God. Now, we can do the wrong thing as stewards of God's creation, 
But in the care of this planet, it's always personal. It is always about God, the creator of the world. You see, when God created this world, he took with his own hands and he planted a garden, the Garden of Eden. And he put Adam and Eve in that garden and he warned them about the reality of sin. And he said, the reality of sin is this. If you eat of that tree, if you sin against me, you will die. And what did they do with God's revelation of reality? They questioned it. They denied it. They went against it. They thought they were wiser than God. Yes, a talking snake had something to do with it, but that should have been the first clue, right? I mean, what's going on here? We better get back to God as fast as we can. But instead, they looked at that fruit, and instead of seeing death, they saw beauty. Instead of seeing death, they saw life, something that would taste good, something that would make them feel as if they were wise. And in our story today, how incredible it is that as the tenants caring for the owner's vineyard are slacking off, they're not producing the fruit, the owner sends them people to warn them, hey, you guys need to up your game here. They beat them up. They kill them. And the owner thinks, hmm, I'll send them my son. Surely they will listen to the son I love. And when the son comes, here's the crazy denial and delusion of reality. The tenants say, here comes the son. You beauty, let's kill him and we'll get the whole thing for ourselves. Now how delusional do you have to be to think that's what happens when you kill the owner's son? What's the owner going to do? Just say, yeah, I didn't like that guy anyway. Here, have everything. I mean, this is the delusion of sin at its best. And that is how we live life all the time. And if this is your first time to church or you haven't been coming very long, to be honest with you, this is why we come every week. All of us here recognize that in each of us, yeah, we, we deny reality. We're deluded about the effects of sin in our own lives. And we come here for a reality check every Sunday. The music helps give us that reality check. The reading of the Bible, the talking to each other. Oh yeah, we're living in, this is what the world is really like. This is what God is really like. And what God is really like is that sin is personal and sin has always been horrible. There has never been anything good about sin. When God stood up to Adam and Eve and he warned them, the day you eat of this, you will surely die. You will bring death into my creation and you don't want that. God knew the reality of what sin would do. And so he lovingly warned them. And ever since then, we've been paying the terrible consequences that we didn't listen. <clears throat> Back in just a couple of weeks ago, I'm not sure if you heard what happened in Tanzania, an African country. There was a group of YWAM missionaries who had been on a retreat, executive leadership training retreat. Too many buses full of YWAM missionaries from around the world. And as they were going back to their base, a construction truck coming in the other direction lost its brake, came across, smashed into the buses. Eleven of those missionaries were killed. Eleven, a further eight, were sent to hospital. You see, sin really is horrible. <clears throat> and sometimes I would hate to have been the parent of one of those children, one of those missionaries. Sometimes when we get that call that the horror of sin has struck home, we ask ourselves, where was God's love? Where was God? Why didn't he stop that from happening and I'll tell you where God was. He was back in the Garden of Eden warning us, don't do it or death will come. And reality is that's what death looks like. And it looks like what's happening around us in our broken world all the time. And so you see the story that Jesus is telling us today about the nation of Israel was worth getting out of bed for this morning. 
It was worth coming here to listen to because while it is about the nation of Israel and the terrible price they paid, there is something more to this. There is also the reality of the coming judgment. And the reality of the coming judgment, Jesus says, is far worse than the reality of death. All right? Can can you hear that? Jesus, as he's walking and talking on the face of this earth, yes, he's interacting with the reality of death, but he's saying there is a judgment coming. And this judgment has always been personal. What do I mean by that? Well, it looks like this. Jesus, as he tells the story, the people listen to it, and then he says to the people, what do you think should happen to these wicked tenants? That's personal. Jesus gives them an opt-in for what do you think their punishment should look like? And what do they say? They say, oh, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. That's the judgment of the people. The owner will bring those wretches to a wretched end. You see, inside each of us, there is this longing for justice. We want justice to come when something wrong has been done. But we always find it easier to bring justice in the lives of others than judgment on ourselves. And what Jesus does with this reality check is he says, yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen. God is going to take the kingdom from you and he's going to give it to people who will bear the fruit of that kingdom. And when the people heard this news, they were shocked. Luke When he tells the story of Jesus, Luke says the people's response was, No! May it never be! And that expression hardly gives us the emotion behind what they were saying. It's the same emotion that you read about in the Bible and in some countries when the bad news come, they tear their clothes off. and No! Impossible! Don't let this happen. It can't be true. And Jesus wants us to have that clear of an understanding of the judgment that is coming. This is how he puts it earlier in Matthew's gospel. In chapter 5 and verse 22, he says, Those who continue to sin will be in the danger of the fire of hell. Those are the words of Jesus. In Matthew 18, he says, They will be thrown into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you ever been thrown? Do you know what it's like to be picked up off of your feet and be absolutely helpless? That's what the Jewish people are feeling as Jesus tells this story. They're like, no, no, no. And they are thrown into outer darkness where there's weeping. That crying that if you've ever had bad news where you you can't stop crying. Jesus sees this with his own eyes because he's looking into the past. He's looking into the future. Jesus knows the reality of the coming judgment as clearly as God knew the reality of death that would come from disobedience. And the God who says death is really bad, trust me, is the same God who says the coming judgment is really bad, trust me. And so Jesus says in Matthew 13... This is how it will be at the end of the age. This isn't just an opinion. This isn't just, let me see if I can make up a good story here. No, Jesus says this is reality. This is what the end of the age is going to look like. Matthew 13 and verse 49. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked? Jesus wants his disciples, his followers, his listeners to understand very clearly this is what the end is going to look like. Now, some people stumble 
all over themselves and all over the teaching of Jesus, like this rock, this stone that we read about and we'll, we'll get to in a minute. They stumble all over it with the fire. How can there be fire that lasts forever? Well, I can't explain everything that God can do, but let me just say this. In the Bible, God's already given us two examples of fire that doesn't consume. And one was with Moses at the burning bush, where a bush was on fire, burning with the presence of God, and it didn't burn up. And then again, when the nation of Israel did go away into the judgment, as God said would happen, they're in Babylon, and the king of Babylon makes this massive furnace, and he throws three of the Jewish young men into that furnace. The men who threw them into the furnace were torched. Those three young men walked around. There is a fire that can burn and never consume. You see, we really don't want to believe God has created a place of eternal fire of eternal torment, where there will be continual anger, crying, a sense of how could have I been so stupid that never ends. <clears throat> so the aim of the story that Jesus tells is to deliver really horrible news, bad news. The nation of Israel has blown it. While it is for them at the, the higher level, it is for us too. And so Jesus wants to connect us with reality through the story, but then also with a stone. And you see, at the very blackest moment of this story, Jesus brings out a stone to show us all of its beauty. And Jesus says this in Matthew 21 and verse 42. Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. When things are at their blackest in this story, when it seems absolutely hopeless, when they're like, no, may it never be, Jesus talks about a stone. And set against the backdrop of judgment, of a blackness that cannot be penetrated, that will never end, is the glory and the beauty of this stone. When you go to the jewelers and you want to look at a diamond, they'll bring it out to you on some black velvet. It's a little bit hard to see the black velvet because the black velvet, the design of that is to show how beautiful the stone is, right? You don't go to the jewelers and say, "Ah, I'd come to look at a bit of black velvet today, thanks. No, you say, I'd like to look at some stones. What do you have? And this is exactly what Jesus does as now he says, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And here, when Jesus speaks about this stone, he goes further back than Isaiah. He goes all the way back to the Psalms. And he quotes from the Psalm about this stone. And it's so interesting that the Jewish leaders for centuries have been debating about this stone. Is it the Messiah? Who is it talking about? And Jesus says, ta-da, it's me. I'm here. And this is the beautiful thing about the Bible. We can jump into the Gospel of Matthew and we can see what God is doing in his kingdom plans with the nation of Israel, their failures, and God's plan to redeem their failures in a way that his kingdom work goes from them to all the nations of the world and it comes to us because of the stone. So now instead of going back from Jesus' story, we're going to go forward to one of the men who was with Jesus when he told this story and uttered uttered these words. His name was Peter. And this is what Peter writes sort of as a commentary on what Jesus said. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 4, Peter said, As you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him 
will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. So the final reality I want us to talk about is the reality of this cornerstone this morning. The reality that as Jesus came into the world and was rejected, the stone that was rejected rose again and became the cornerstone. Now I have a picture of a cornerstone up here for us this morning. And uh, this cornerstone says uh, it's in honor of St. Vincent de Paul, laid in 1866. And you see, the purpose of the cornerstone is when the builders are building that building, they want to take that cornerstone, they'll run their string lines off of this cornerstone so that all the levels of the brick and all the building will be even, and even better than that, they'll put some values there. Here's a guy we don't want you to forget. Now, in the next stone, very hard to see, sorry, it says A.D. 1984. A.D. stands for Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, 1984. You see, the reality of the stone, Jesus Christ, is that all of time, all of history revolves around him. And I'm not saying that the calendar is the ultimate proof of that, not by any stretch of the imagination. I don't care what the calendar says. It's still true. Because the Bible says God's big plan is for everything to be connected to Jesus. He is the cornerstone. And the way we come to understand our reality is to tie our string line to him. It's to keep our eyes on him. And we gather together to look at the stone, to come out of the brokenness of the world, the brokenness that has landed on us, the brokenness that is done by us, and look at the beauty, the symmetry, the awesomeness, the plan of God. And Peter goes on to say, those who trust in him will never be put to shame. You see, we are safe in this world because the builders rejected the stone and the stone came back to life as the cornerstone. We are safe because Jesus was safe. Now let me tell you what safety looked like for Jesus. For Jesus, it looked like being whipped and abused. That was safety for him. It looked like hanging on a cross. It looked like having our shame laid on him so we would never be put to shame. It looked like being rejected and despised by all the people he came to love and to save. That was safety, I say safety for Jesus. Now, if you are in a situation where you feel unsafe, I want you to hear me very clearly. Talk to someone here this morning. We want to help you with that. Because when I talk about Jesus being safe, clearly I'm saying, oh, it didn't appear that he was safe. He didn't experience comfort and safety in the way that you and I want to experience it. When I say Jesus was safe, he was safe because he trusted in God. And on the third day, God raised him from the dead. You see, when we keep our eyes on Jesus as our cornerstone and we align our reality with him, no matter what brokenness, horror comes into our lives, that's the reality. Jesus already went through us, through that for us. He is going through it with us. And God brought him back to life. That's why Peter can say, whoever puts their trust in him will never be put to shame. You'll never feel stupid ultimately. That's what shame is, right? I feel so stupid. I feel, what a loser. I'm worthless. I'm hopeless. And, and Jesus says, no, no, no. Don't feel that way. Look at me. I felt that way one time too. I felt rejected, despised, but I trusted in God and ultimately he raised me from the dead. Friends, our great reality is that this life is not all there is. We don't only live once. 
we live forever if we are connected to Jesus as our cornerstone. Perhaps some of your Bibles have the word capstone there, and that's just another aspect of the stone that I want to talk on because I think it's really important. The capstone is the one that goes at the top of the arch, and, and sometimes the translators will say cornerstone or capstone because the reality is it can be both. And this is the beauty of the capstone. The capstone sits at the top of the archway and it holds everything together. Listen to how Paul expressed this about Jesus in Colossians 1 verses 16 to 17. For in him, this is Jesus, in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. <clears throat> what a glorious reality. As we look at Jesus Christ today, in the story that he tells, in his vulnerability, he's there, he looks right at the men who are about to murder him, and he says, you're going to reject me. But that's not the ultimate reality. I'm going to trust my father to the very end and I will be raised to life. This life is not all there is. There's more to come. And so the question is this morning, how will you respond to the story of Jesus? Will you fall on this stone and be shattered and broken? Well, if that's where you are this morning, there's hope because Jesus has a marvelous way of putting together broken pieces as vessels of jars of clay so that his glory can shine through us. It is only him who can make sense out of our brokenness in the first place. But if you reject this stone because you stumble and fail to believe, the stone will come and crush and pulverize and there will be no hope. This is how the Jewish leaders responded in Matthew 21. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked away for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Friends, we're coming up to Easter you have an opportunity to look at this stone, the Lord Jesus Christ, in a very special way. Look and live, believe, and you will not be put to shame. Let's pray together. Oh, loving God, thank you for your incredible mercy, for the reality that you are alive, that you created this world, that you made it a place to be lived in and enjoyed, that you, dear God, are in absolute control. Your kingdom will come. Your, it, your will will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Help us to see Jesus today, the beauty and glory that he brings into our broken world to be healed and forgiven by him so that we can live forever with you in that glorious reality and not in the, in the horror that really will come to those who do not trust in you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.